Good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. Uh, myself and Gavin Bridge are ready to take you on a tour of the media landscape. Uh, no caffeine necessary to kick off South by. This is going to be all you need. Uh, but we're happy to be here. What better place than this festival to take the pulse of everything going on across the media business today? And that's basically what our job is at Variety Intelligence Platform. We're a new offshoot of the Variety brand dedicated to digging into the issues that matter most to the business. That means we cover a lot of ground. So what we're going to do is take you on this tour of the entire media landscape, and we're going to do it in just 22 slides packed with some really interesting data. We want to get your questions. Please use the South by app by the end of the session, probably at about 45 minutes in, we're going to do that Q&A. Uh, the goal here is not to just give you a sense of the business today, but as the title suggests, the road to tomorrow. Just one warning, though. We are going to use some industry buzzwords that you've probably heard about a million times. It may melt some of your brains. So if you have any health issues whatsoever, please leave now before we get started and apologize in advance. But let's get started. So the road to the future starts in the Wall Street of today. All hail the king. Remember when people used to be worried if Tim Cook was going to be able to fill Steve Jobs' shoes? Fast forward to today, I wonder if Jobs ever envisioned that Apple would be a trillion dollar valuation company, one of several in the space. And you know, nothing puts the scale, the massive scale of these companies in perspective more than lining them up next to these media companies. If you'll note, Meta, which I think uh, you'll remember last month had the largest market cap wipeout in the history of the stock market and is down about 40% year to date, it's still about double the size of the biggest media company, Disney. Uh, it's interesting when you get that comparison with the media midgets. Now you'll say, okay, but you're comparing two different industries, to which I will say, are we really? I mean, this gets to the heart of the VIP, the variety intelligence approach to media and tech. We see it as one converged industry. Uh, look at all the commonalities they have. At the end of the day, media and tech are all about going after mind share, attention. And whether it's your eyes with video or your ears with audio, we're, they're, they're, both businesses are looking to do the same things. They want your subscription dollars and they want your advertising dollars and they're all going direct to consumer around the globe. Something else they have in common I should point out is both sides of this chart are really hurting on Wall Street uh, in the past few months. Media in 2020 was having a great ride. Everyone decided to get in the streaming business and Wall Street loved it. Fast forward to 2021 and it's like Wall Street has fallen out of love with that business. They want, they're concerned about costs. They realize not everybody, and you know there's a lot of players out there, are going to be in this market. And technology has had a similar arc. 2020 was great. 2021 has been tough, which is saying something because of the size of these companies. I think that's a response to some of the macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic conditions out there from inflation, we've got an interest rate hike coming, obviously the tragic war in the Ukraine. This is keeping even the biggest tech companies down. But you know what? I wouldn't give them too much sympathy. I think these companies are, are gonna be just fine in the long run. And I wanna put in perspective just how powerful those companies are. I love this stat on the left, global network traffic. It really is the most basic sense of how much consumption is going on on all the apps owned by the biggest companies. And if you'll see, there's been quite a flip-flop that for the first time in 2021, whereas back in 2019, pre-pandemic, the biggest companies had about a 43% versus the entire rest of the internet, that is now flip-flopped. They are now at a good 56%. And so when you see this concentration of power, it's also the same reflected in digital advertising. Uh, if you look on the chart on the right, I think just between Meta and Alphabet, they control over 50% of digital advertising dollars. That's you know the largest market there is, basically. 
no coincidence why, again, it really does come down to the pandemic, which killed a bunch of ad categories in the past few years, not for digital advertising, double digit growth every year. And these companies, Meta and Alphabet, Meta makes 98% of their advertising revenue from their revenue from advertising. For Alphabet, that's 81%. So they're tremendously dependent on it. The pandemic not only didn't the pandemic not only helped, it basically accelerated the e-commerce business uh, that today now seems like a permanent part of the landscape. But in the interest of giving you a sense of the future, what used to be called, I mean, this is not a new trend that Meta and Alphabet are as dominant as they are, this duopoly. But here's a few things you need to take note of in terms of this concentration of power. Number one, as you can see here, Amazon is growing and growing fast. So I think we're probably on the verge of a triopoly. In addition, Amazon is one of a number of what we call retail media networks. Companies that you don't think of as being in digital advertising like Walmart and Target, they are leveraging their consumer data in a way that is making them significant market shareholders as well. And one last point is don't be surprised if what I see as a triopoly starts to become a quadropoly in the longer term. And that is because of one company that I think will be joining their ranks. Net, uh, I almost said Netflix. <laughs> TikTok. Uh, TikTok has really been the incredible success story of social media. Look on the chart on your right first, because you could see here, just in terms of global downloads, how much TikTok is growing faster than everyone else. Yes, Facebook is still number one, but you know, the thing is with TikTok, it's not really just a numbers story. You all see it. It's at the epicenter of youth culture. There's simply nothing like TikTok out there as a cultural force. I think it has a lot to do with their secret sauce, that content recommendation algorithm that is so powerful. And here's the thing I think you have to keep in mind. It's still early days for TikTok. They're still fairly new. And if I see one big trend that is going impact, to impact not just TikTok, but all these companies in, in social media, it's this social commerce trend. People using video to sell products. It's already huge in Asia. This is like globally a $500 billion business. It's barely started in the US and it's gonna be big and TikTok is going to lead the way there. Which isn't to say that, you know, obviously I'm obsessing on TikTok here, but there's plenty of big companies playing well in this space. We mentioned Facebook, Instagram, still there. Even in decline, they're still massive. Snap is doing fine. Twitter refocusing with new leadership. So there's a lot of players here ready to play. But there is still a pretty big cloud hanging over this space. Regulation. It's a very real threat. It's coming from three different levels at this point. You're seeing activity in Congress. You are seeing things in terms of at the state level and, of course, the DOJ and the FTC. And, you know, on the one hand, this is very focused on the social media market because there's dozens of bills right now in Congress that are aimed at curbing the big problems, misinformation, data transparency, protecting consumer privacy. Of course, there's, for all these bills, there really has not been much progress because there's been so much polarization on Capitol Hill. And, you know, I think what we're going to see is that once the midterm elections happen, that's when you're going to start to see some real activity. And, of course, who wins the houses will be depending on what direction that activity takes. Also, this isn't just a U.S.-centric phenomenon. Let's not forget my friends at TikTok. Um, the Biden administration has already said that there's going to be a federal review of how foreign-owned apps use consumer data. So something else to keep an eye on. But the other thing I want you to look at, and it's really to the left side of this, is social media is one thing. Antitrust is another big area of focus. The DOJ and FTC alone, look at the, sh the wealth of activity they have in terms of monitoring all the various antitrust issues going on at the biggest tech companies. And the thing is, is all indications are, and there hasn't been much indication, but there's some, that the Biden administration is ready to clamp down here on the antitrust front. If you look who runs the FTC and DOJ who Biden appointed, these are known anti-monopoly activists. So there is a lot at stake on the regulatory front. It may seem quiet right now compared to like 
a year ago when there was like a congressional hearing every day and the, the Facebook whistleblower, Francis Hogan, like things may seem like they've died down, but they really haven't. So this is gonna impact one of the biggest trends going on in media right now, and that is M&A. Consolidation has been afoot, we've all seen it. You'd have to go back to that first slide to get a great understanding of why that is. Remember that uh, the tech companies lined up against the, the media companies. If the media companies want to compete with the sheer scale of the audiences that the tech companies serve, well, then they're going to have to combine and pool their audiences. And so when you see a deal that's pending like AT&T uh, about to scoop up Warner Media, that's gonna be a big deal. It's, it's just the sheer volume of, of what is to come here, I think is something to take note of. It's, it's not even, I, I just think potential for more deals is very big right now. I think you have to look at beyond Discovery Warner, I think once Discovery ingests Warner Media, I don't think that's where they're gonna stop. I do think they will try to look for more companies. If you recall, Discovery's largest shareholder, John Malone, once referred to a, a certain breed of smaller media company out there as free radicals. Companies like Lionsgate, AMC Networks. These companies are ripe for the picking because the smallest companies simply have to combine with others to survive. Another potential deal I'd say to keep an eye on, Viacom CBS and NBC Universal. Their products in the streaming war are not hitting the first tier of competitors. There's only gonna be so much that are ready to play. I would guarantee that by the end of the year, you're going to see one, at least one of those companies get acquired, do some acquiring, maybe of those free radicals, or yes, maybe even combine with each other, which would be the most powerful combination. And this is, I'm, I'm just talking intra-media here. Don't forget that the tech companies, as you can see on the right, the deal volume they've been dealing with in recent years shows there's an appetite there that may only be held in check by the fear of regulation, but Amazon is already going after the MGM. Uh, FTC is, of course, taking a close look at that deal, and I think it's just a matter of time before Apple, which could buy every company in this space combined, given the cash flow they're sitting on, I think in the longer term, I expect Apple to make a major deal. So all things to keep an eye on. All in all, M&A transactions in the media and tech space rose 27% year over year last year, and it didn't stop at the conglomerate level. There's a whole other level of deal making I want you guys to take note of. Uh, production companies in the past six to 12 months have become a very, very hot entity in Hollywood. Private equity in particular doing a lot of shopping there uh, more than they have in recent years. And you know, you might look at some of these faces like Reese Witherspoon and LeBron and say, okay, this is the usual investors chasing the shiny object. Not so fast. I would say that production companies owned by celebrities actually benefit from their massive social following. They have this ability to market not only to the social followings in the hundreds of millions, but they can get involved in commerce. So these production companies have some real value. Now, that's not the only thing that has been driving the M&A surge as of late. Surely you've heard of SPACs, Special Purpose Acquisition Companies. Uh, these are the companies that, uh, it's sort of like an alternative to the IPO. You get out into the market much quicker. And so, I think there was a tremendous amount of hype here that is fast, fast fading because just about all of the companies, and VIP has tracked a lot of this in the media space, dozens of deals, almost none of them have stock prices higher than when they launched. I think the SPAC route is falling out of favor fast. The SEC has indicated that they are looking at some more stringent accounting guidelines, not good news for Donald Trump and his truth social venture. Uh, I think you're gonna see the traditional IPO come back, and there are some media companies looking at that as well, uh, Reddit, uh, IPTPG, which uh, controls some of the talent agencies. But ultimately, I think SPACs are really just a sideshow. I think what's really driving this deal making is the content boom being driven by the streaming services. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my friend Gavin, and I'll be back in a bunch of slides. Here you go. Lovely. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy. Yep, there is a real boom in content going on right now. And that includes sports, 
Movies, TV shows, so dramas, true crime, pretty much anything you can watch. Spending keeps going up and up and up. In 2020, it was estimated to be worth $107 billion. Content spend for just the companies on this chart, the US-based um, entertainment firms. That's rising to 20, in 2025 to $172 billion, so an increase of 61%. There's a number of factors driving this. Several of these media companies are competing on multiple fronts. They're trying to somewhat keep their traditional TV business alive while shifting some resources over to streaming in order to compete with the big boys there. And talking of the big boys, Netflix is the biggest boy. Um, you can see on the, the chart on the right, they always have the highest amount of content spend estimated for every single year out for 2025. The amount is slowing down, but they're still spending an absolute fortune. And the reason for this is it's a moat, right? If you want to compete with Netflix, which is the really the ambition of all these companies other than AMC who have said they were quite happy being a niche complementary service ahead of trying to outright take over the world. If you want to compete on a global scale, you need to spend like Netflix, but you may not have the money to spend like Netflix, which is kind of a catch-22. So we're going to see really the deeper pocketed firms, the Disneys, the Amazons, Apple could do it if they really wanted to, really take over in an effort to sort of be on the first tier with Netflix globally, and then we'll see the other companies they're gonna do okay. Are they gonna reach 250 million subscribers? Perhaps not, but they're not, they're not gonna fade away. But just point out something like Comcast. If you're predicted to spend about a fifth of what Netflix is spending on content for your streaming services, you might not be competing with them like, like for like. So on a topic of paid streaming, here you can see the US streaming services. Nine of these have a global subscriber base of 20 million people or more. So there's a very big battle going on, a hell of a lot of subscribers. But so many streaming services means we're coming into an issue of sub subscriber scarcity. And Netflix really is the bellwether of the market here. They came out in January in their earnings call and they reported, oh, we didn't really get that many people this year. The markets, to what Andy was saying, crashed, right? People were like, that's terrible. Oh my God, streaming is over. And it took until Disney reported three weeks later that their numbers were actually up for people to realize that Netflix doesn't actually speak for the entire market anymore. But it's becoming very important because the value of these companies is based on this premise of unrelenting growth. You know, like every bubble the stock market has ever seen. This one will be different. Um, perhaps the investors want Netflix to have half a billion or a billion um, subscribers, which probably isn't possible. So if you're in this catch or in this situation where you need to get more revenue, but you may not be able to grow your subscribers as much, and you need to retain your current subscribers, hence the increased content spend, you want to keep them staying around. You've got a couple of options to grow your revenue. You can enter new geographic regions. Netflix can't do that because they're in every geographic region, but some of the smaller companies still can. You can enter new markets. Andy's going to be speaking in a little bit about how Netflix is entering mobile gaming, and this is a potential future revenue stream for them. Or you can create ad-supported tiers of your products. Now, many of these products actually launched with ad-supported tiers. They didn't give themselves a lot of room in the future for growth, but Disney just announced this week that they're gonna have an ad-supported tier of Disney Plus. It's very important news because, yeah, it will cost a little bit cheaper, but they make so much more money from the advertising dollars that you actually make more money on an ad-supported tier than the more expensive non-ad-supported tier. And Netflix's CFO said this week that they're not against an ad tier in the future. Never been said before, also means they are going to have ads in the future at some point. Maybe five years, it's gonna happen. So talking about the ad-supported tiers of, of SVODs moving into connected TV, because they, they're very interlinked. Connected TV, or CTV in the industry, is a catch-all term for any sort of revenue derived from streaming and advertising together. So there's three main sources of that, the ad-supported SVODs, there's TV Everywhere, which is a much maligned term that never caught on, but it's literally when you go on to your, you know, you have a cable subscription, you go onto like Nick Jr. or the Discovery app, you log in and you can stream on demand content from the TV networks and it's ad supported. And then there's free streaming. Two types of free streaming, AVOD, ad supported video on demand, which um, is literally like Netflix, you click on it, the, the title starts right away. Or there's fast, free ad-supported streaming TV. By the way, you might notice that the, there's all these extra S's that aren't actually included in these acronyms. No one uses the supported and ad-supported. So fast is just spelt like the regular word. 
that is literally like cable. Streaming channels, you pick a channel as, uh, th that you want to watch and you join it in progress. Now, these four sources amount to well, $13 billion in connected TV advertising spend in 2021. This is estimated by eMarketer to grow to 24 billion in 2025. That's 82% um, increase. This explains why everyone is trying to enter this market. You've got big tech companies who are launching or have um, connected devices. So Amazon has Fire TV. Amazon's also trying to get into the free stream business to further control um, a share of the ad market. So they have IMDB TV and Twitch. Then you have TV manufacturers who are creating their own services. So Samsung, LG, Vizio all have streaming services that you can watch with a click of the button on the remote. And even like Comcast just brought out their own version of a smart TV to, that they power to get to this. So everyone is trying to get a share of connected TV because it's new revenue. We're going to see this more in the future. Like just, you'll see more companies launching services or channels, more companies probably buying each other, like Roku is one that's rumored. It's really the only independent one available, but someone will probably take Roku for that. It's just a growing ad market to be aware of. So, now this, this may sound kind of obvious based on the slide I showed you before about content spend. If you're spending more on content, you're probably getting more TV shows, and that's what we're seeing here. 2021 was a record year for, the, for new TV series. 1,923 shows across streaming and TV. But it might not be as surprising as, you, as it sounds because since 2002, every year has set a record apart from two years and they were due to external forces. 2008 had the Writers Guild strike, TV shows couldn't be made. 2020 had the pandemic, we all remember what happened there. But I think 2022 is gonna see over 2,000 shows. We're gonna hit a new pinnacle for television. Now, last year was actually a very interesting year because it was the first year where streaming actually made more shows than TV. We've reached the tipping point. We're never going to get back to that again. Streaming is now the premier uh, creator of content. And this actually isn't all of, if you were to assume who's doing this, it's not necessarily Netflix and Amazon. The TV networks themselves have taken it upon themselves to kind of erode their existing business model. So take Discovery Plus about 195 new shows last year exclusive to their streaming platform that would have been on cable before. And you can see the orange line going down and the green blue line going up to sort of show where they're putting their resources. So you've got these traditional TV companies who make a hell of a lot of money from TV still, and they're weakening their value proposition. They're literally asking you as a consumer, I mean, most people here are probably young. We're not, I would imagine, representative of, of people who have cable, for instance, but if, if you did have cable, they're asking you, would you pay more, because we increase our prices every year, would you be happy that we cut the number of, con you know, the amount of content on our channels, and then would you please pay extra for our streaming service? And surprisingly enough, people are saying no. Um, you've got 10 million people left the pay TV ecosystem in the last five years. This isn't the entire number, this is really based on the public companies, but it's the major companies. So we're talking Dish, Comcast, Spectrum, um, just the big cable, satellite, and the virtual providers. So they're called VMVPDs, that's YouTube TV, Hulu with Live TV, Sling, Philo, Fubu, and yeah, 10 million people left, but that's actually masking a 22 million person decline for the traditional providers. Half of those went into the virtual providers, half of them exited completely. Now you might ask yourself, well, it's probably a terrible time to, to be a cable company now, right? Actually, it's not so bad. I mean, right now, yes, video still creates a lot of revenue for these guys, but broadband is making more revenue, and broadband is infinitely more profitable because you do not have to share your profits, your, your revenue stream from broadband with internet sites, with streaming services like you do for TV. The TV companies get a cut from every single subscriber. If you're USA, you get about a dollar from every uh, cable subscriber across the board. So therefore, that's really the profits aren't there in traditional video. That's why the video providers are like, you're gonna go, okay, see you. You're gonna buy our internet. Um, but there are two main things that are keeping people in that pay TV system. You know, like why, if, if it's so great to stream and you can get things outside, why does, is there still 76 million people with pay TV? Sports is a key reason here. Sports, one of the types of content that, you know, there's a real 
abundance of content these days, and it's eroded what we used to see as water cooler talk. You think back to, you'd come to work on, on a Monday, and you're like, oh my god, who saw Game of Thrones? Who saw Boardwalk Empire or Mad Men? And everyone would talk. That's gone because there's so much content now. There's very few shows that people watch individually as they air. Sports is different. If you try and miss sports, it's going to get spoiled for you. And here we can see why. 96 of the top 100 shows last year were sports. 83 of those the NFL. These are huge magnets for viewers. And the sports leagues know their worth. That's why in recent um, re rights negotiations, the NFL doubled their value to $10 billion a year just for their TV rights. There's a couple more coming this year. NFL Sunday Ticket. Expect Apple actually to be a player for this now, given what they uh, announced with MLB this week and their digital rights for web and mobile viewership, which is currently held by Yahoo TV. But the biggest sports deal to keep your eye on, the only major league to not see a renewal in recent years is the NBA. NBA, I think we're going to see at least double to about $4.5 billion a year across TV and streaming, mainly because it, on, even on cable, it draws 1 to 2 million viewers a week. These are primarily 18 to 49's key marketing targets. It's very valuable. But sports is not the only thing out there that is keeping people in the system. Cable news is too. Cable news has always been important, but as viewers have uh, shifts have changed and people don't really watch content live anymore, it's growing importance to cable shines through. 2016, 57% of all of cable news, sorry, all, all of the top 5,000 5, shows was cable news. In 2021, that rose to 82% of the top 5,000 most watched shows. So if you were going to say sports is pay TV sizzle, news really is the stake. And the reason for this, two main reasons. It's got to be watched live. I mean, no one out there is binge watching Tucker Carlson, I hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we never know. Um, but also, there's no alternative to this. You can't go on Netflix and find political opinion news. You can't go onto any streaming service and find this kind of content. And it's actually. Um, powering their SVOD expansions too. The new services have their own streaming services, right? Fox News has Fox Nation, CNN's about to launch CNN Plus. And what these do very smartly, unlike the rest of TV, is they don't cannibalize their audience. If you get Fox Nation, you can't watch Hannah T or Tucker Carlson. You have to watch Fox News for that. What you get is supplementary co content. You might see them doing cooking shows, documentaries. It's really to engage the fan base and to keep it going, to make more money from it, but not kill the golden goose. Now, not everything is rosy with news. Ratings fell last year. Pat on the back for us. We were the first people a month ahead of everyone to say CNN's ratings were down. They didn't like that. Um, but then eventually, you know, reality caught up, and we've seen it. Like, ever since the boogeyman left the off public office for the, at least CNN's audience, the audience has dissipated. News is becoming synonymous with entertainment. And we even see this with digital news. It's not just TV. The, the stat on the right is from December, and it shows 22 of the top 25 most watched news sites saw a decline. So news really, it needs entertainment these days. Um, and that really is the future of news. And now I'm going to hand back to Andy, because he is going to take us through the rest of entertainment. Thank you, Gavin. Hope everyone's enjoying the data and insights they're getting. If you think this is a lot, please welcome you to check out Variety Intelligence Platform. There's a lot more to come. And uh, also, a reminder to you all that the South By app is the place where you could ask questions that we will address towards the end of this session. But I want to switch gears to another world. Uh, we've talked a lot about change and how the pandemic has impacted a lot of corners of the media business. No more, I believe, than film, which I think has faced the greatest impact perhaps the most permanent impact. You see it to some degree on the releasing of films and how that has changed. You all know, if you think back decades, there was a very regimented system about films, 90 days in theater, then DVD, then it goes to TV or streaming. The pandemic absolutely changed all of that. Not just that, but also the fact that the studios are connected to streaming services owned by companies that really want to drive value to those streaming services. And so in the chart on the left, you're seeing that that 90-day window, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Different studios are trying different things. If you'll notice uh, along the bottom, I just want to pinpoint Disney and Sony and, and Warner Brothers at a more conservative 45 days. But even in Canto, and I please, no Bruno song today. We, I've heard enough. Um, that went 30 days 
um, to Disney Plus. So even Disney, which because, I mean, if you look at the movie business these days, it's really Disney and then everybody else, although Sony, I think, is doing pretty well as well. Um, this is Disney, the fact that they're being flexible about a movie like Encanto, it's showing that all these studios are trying different ways to go here and trying to figure this out. I think we're in for a lot of experimentation on this front. On the right is what's known as a pay one window, uh, a chart about that. These are, it used to be like 10 years ago, studios would sell the rights to a slate of movies for hundreds of million dollars, usually to cable networks. Look how much has changed now as the pay one window starts to come to these streaming services. It's just a very different game. Now, while we're seeing the studios are doing a lot of innovating, I, I hate to say it, I think this might be a too little too late. If you look at the box office chart there, look, there's some good news. We just saw the Batman open real big last week, and that was great, and that's not alone. There's been a number of success stories, but even in the best case scenario, if you go back to the high point, I think the box office uh, was, I think, about 11.3 billion domestic. We're just talking domestic here. Uh, that was a peak. At best, we're gonna see this year is probably eight or nine billion. So, that's a lot of money that is getting lost, and you gotta know that the exhibitors are freaking out about that. You saw during the pandemic, and you see on the chart on the right, how much those closures affected theaters. And it's really starting some existential questions here. And I wanna start with the one that may be in half of your brains right now. I'm not about to say the movie business is gonna die. I don't think that at all. I do think the movie business, and I mean specifically sort of the footprint of theaters, is going to shrink in the coming years. And it's a reflection of the fact that, for the most part, the blockbuster movies, the, the Marvels of the world are doing well and will continue to do well. And I think horror will also have the staying power at theaters. But I think most mid-budget, low-budget art house movies, I think the theatrical play for them is going to shrink dramatically over time. And I think that streaming is gonna be the big uh, beneficiary of that trend. I think also in terms of the exhibitors, I'm sure you're following the drama with AMC and the meme stock phenomenon. I don't think that's gonna end well, but ultimately I do think the big exhibitor companies are gonna stick around. They're probably gonna consolidate with each other to some degree. Um, one more word on the Batman though. I don't know if you guys noticed that AMC did a very interesting experiment over that first weekend by adding a dollar or two, I forget exactly how much, to the price. I think this is an extremely notable trend. I think this is the beginning of a lot of these exhibitors that are going to do what they haven't done before, which is certain bigger movies may command a higher price. It used to always be, no matter what movie you watched, it was the same price with some degree of experimentation. You're gonna see a lot more of it, and that may be the very thing that actually helps the exhibitors get over this shortfall that is gonna happen inevitably regardless. So, Movie theaters aren't the only corner of the industry that were greatly affected by the pandemic, especially in terms of what I call out-of-home entertainment. And I think the big difference is gonna be that while I'm very much predicting that the movie theaters are going to have a, a secular decline in front of them, not necessarily extinction, but ser some serious shrinkage, a lot of these other businesses that I'm about to talk about I think are gonna be very resilient and are gonna bounce back big over time. Let's start with theme parks, which, I mean, the pandemic, look at the data on the left, the amount of closures at these huge parks, it did a lot of damage, particularly in the first year. But in 2021, as COVID started to abate somewhat, things bounced back big. And if you just saw this last quarter, Disney had the second best quarter they've ever had for the theme parks. Universal did their best uh, fourth quarter ever. So this business is going to come back not out of the woods entirely. Again, we were talking about these macroeconomic conditions. I do think when you see issues like supply chain affecting costs, theme parks do have some bumps ahead. So we'll see how that recovery continues to happen. Don't have a chart here, but Broadway was a, a company that also got, not a company, an industry that got impacted dramatically. But we are starting to see signs of the bigger stage uh, efforts starting to do better, and so I think there's some, some green shoots there to pay attention to. 
the concert business, as we see here on the left. This all but shut down in uh, 2020 once the pandemic hit. It looked pretty bleak. However, it's starting to come back. Outdoor obviously came back more so than indoor. Different areas of the country doing better than others. Anyone want to hazard a guess as what was the top tour of last year? The Rolling Stones. So there's still a lot of acts out there that are still getting big dollars. And Polestar actually projects that the top 100 concerts will probably be up 12% ahead of 2019. That's when things were normal. So there is big expectations for a big comeback. Live Nation, the biggest concert company, just had a blowout quarter. So wouldn't worry much about this business, except, I almost hate to say it, God forbid another variant comes through. All of this starts to look really shaky. Hopefully that will not happen. Now concerts are, of course, where the real money is made in the music, in the music business. Uh, streaming is not exactly what it used to be. But I want to talk more about the music industry, which is bouncing back big. RIAA data just came out a few days ago um, with a big growth number there, streaming leading the way. Think back to what this industry was like not too long ago in the Napster era, when it looked like rampant piracy was going to kill the industry. Fast forward now, we've got three big music uh, companies in Universal, uh, Warner Brothers, Sony, they did a combined 20 billion, over 20 billion in revenue last year. They're all up about 20% year over year in that regard. Sitting pretty, and look, what's not to like here? They've got big hit makers like Taylor Swift and Adele and Drake. However, if you look on the chart on the left, I think that tells you the real biggest story of the music industry right now. The back catalog business Every week, there's a big headline there about sales that are just absolutely eye-popping. Uh, eye it's, it's, it's really incredible what's going on here. The market for this is being created by everything from video game makers to exercise companies like Peloton, which is practically a media company on wheels, licensing all these old hits. And so a lot of very older, richer stars are getting a lot richer. Private equity is doing a lot of that investing. Here's the interesting data point. It's not on this chart here, but catalog music, which is, I think, uh, maybe any music that's more than a few months old, is actually starting to grow. And it's now 70% of the streaming consumption out there, up from 65 the previous year. Meanwhile, current music is actually dropping by about the same level. So. It really tells you about the power of the long tail going on in streaming right now. It's not just about the new hit makers. So it, it probably won't surprise you to learn that with this growth in music, there's also the growth of the streaming audio business in general. If you look in that pie chart on the left, total subscription streaming being at 25% of the revenue drive, that was at just 17% a few years ago. There is growth happening here. You look at the radio numbers, that's dropping. Now radio, you know, which almost seems old fashioned nowadays, it's still where the wealth of the ear consumption is happening, but there is a very clear transition that is happening as streaming grows and radio drops. And we're seeing that the companies leading the way are the big streaming players on the right. It's interesting to note when you look at it through podcasts, where a lot of this consumption is starting to happen, YouTube is actually bigger than Spotify. Even Spotify gets a lot of the headlines around here because they're doing the most investing on the podcast front. You know, when you combine music, audiobooks, podcasts, we're talking about what uh, the Consumer Tech Association estimated is a $13 billion in spend in 2021. That was up 15%. No wonder you've got, with you know, the music business is not exactly the best business for Spotify. They uh, have to split a lot of that money with uh, the record labels. Podcasts are able to really own a lot more of it. That's why they've bought up production companies. They're doing exclusive deals with the likes of Joe Rogan and Austin Native, who I almost don't want to say anything. Is he in the audience here today? Like, okay, we could talk about him. Okay. The truth is, you saw that controversy last month. He's not going anywhere because hit makers the size of Joe Rogan in the podcast world do not grow on trees. To that point, interesting data from Edison Research that came out some months ago. 
Very, almost none of the top 10 podcast attractions started in the last few years. Most of them are pretty old, like Joe Rogan, that have been around almost like a decade. So, you know, there's going to be, I think, here's my prediction of the podcast market. If we don't see some new hits, there is going to be a real retrenchment in all the investment that's going on here because ultimately it needs to pay off. So podcasts are also a very popular platform for the creator economy. If you're not familiar with that term, maybe you've heard of influencers or creators. These are the guys and gals who are, you know, the, the cliche is they're in their own basements. Well, I, I got to tell you, the basement business is doing very well when you look at these numbers. Nearly two-fifths of total consumption time compared to premium entertainment is user-generated content. You look at the teenagers, 13 to 17, that's at 56%. You look at just UGC video, that is neck and neck with premium TV, premium streaming. We've come a long way from cats on skateboards. This is not, and has not been for a while, a fringe phenomenon. If you recognize the individual here, uh, well, you're probably 20 or under, but even if you do, that's Mr. Beast. He's one of the biggest attractions uh, in, in digital native entertainment. He did a recreation of Netflix's phenomenon Squid Game that was probably an eighth of the cost and probably did as many views. It, it was that big. So you don't want to underestimate this market. There's 50 million creators out there on 50 platforms with tons of followers. The pandemic only helped their business because, hey, if you're in a basement recording, you could just keep doing that. Um, and the platforms are falling all over themselves to fund them, getting creator funds going, because that's like the fountain of youth to getting young demographics on their platform. One corner of the creator economy I really like is esports. Here you have a class of self-made stars who have millions of fans around the globe just watching them play video games. And they're forming these incredible leagues that are starting to rival professional, you know, real sports in terms of audience. Right now, it's not the biggest business. It's about a billion dollars. It got impacted a bunch by the fact that the pandemic knocked out live events. But still, there's a lot going on here to like. I think there's a lot of upside. It's very big in Asia. Um, sponsorship is where most of the dollars are right now. But that media rights part of this pie chart, I think you're going to see that start to grow up as that audience starts to grow as well. The company at the center of this phenomenon is Amazon-owned Twitch. The live streaming of this stuff is big business. And by the way, Amazon doesn't just uh, focus on video games on Twitch, everything from politics to e-commerce. But video games is clearly the big player there. And if you see on the left, they've got some serious competition in YouTube and Facebook that also are very active in this space. Now, eSports is also just a small part of the broader video game universe which, if you've been following in early 22, there's been a lot of M&A. The Microsoft Activision Blizzard deal in particular is huge. I'm surprised the media companies aren't more active in this space. It's kind of interesting, if you think about it, uh, video games and video entertainment, you're just vying for the same eyeballs. You would think the media companies would know to invest more here. Netflix, smartly, is getting into this space in a bigger and better way. Uh, it's pretty small investment right now in terms of mobile app gaming, but we've seen the Netflix script before. Think how fast they could ramp up, they did ramp up in TV and original films. Who's to say they're not gonna do this in video games? So you must keep an eye on Netflix. Overall, this is just a massive business. And it's, I think it, in the past 15 years has grown from 200 million video game users to 3 billion. And, and casual gaming, as you can see on the right, mobile apps, this is where the growth is coming from. We talked about the Microsoft Activision deal. You know, why do you do a deal like that? Well, you get a property like Call of Duty, which has a massive long time following. They're not putting an update, update out this year, though. Uh, you're also seeing the acquisition of the King division that Activision owns that will be great for mobile gaming. The console business is no slouch. Microsoft is doing that well, but it is also transitioning to uh, more of a cloud game 
kind of business, and that's what the Activision acquisition is about as well. They want to get in there and have exclusive Activision content that they could put there. The name of the game is to create the Netflix of the gaming business, and I think it's going to happen. I don't know that Netflix is going to be the one to do it. I would keep an eye on Epic Games. They are the makers of Fortnite. Yeah, you know that property. It's huge. I think this is the prime real estate, maybe the primest real estate of all, because it is, I think, the gateway to the next big thing. You didn't think I was going to go through this entire presentation without saying the metaverse, right? You, you know that's the most popular of the buzzwords out there. Whether you're calling it crypto or blockchain, I know there's, it, it's making its way through every industry. You're seeing a lot of evidence here of it in South By as well. Truth be told, I think it's a little too early to say how big this all is going to be for the entertainment industry, but honestly, it's almost too, the hype is too huge to ignore, so I'm gonna go there for a bit. You're seeing the NFT business is really probably where all the energy is right now. Collectibles are big. Frankly, I do not understand how digital ownership works of an image that is readily available anywhere. But let's see how this experimentation goes. But when you talk to the evangelists for this business, they see this as so much more than collectibles. They see this as getting involved in the most basics of entertainment process, production, development, financing. All I can say is I'll believe it when I see it. There's a lot of hype right now. So what do we focus on in the metaverse that would actually make sense? I think you just have to look at where the activity is. Uh, we mentioned Fortnite. You know, another one is Roblox. These are environments where this is where you are seeing the, the, the first wave of the metaverse take shape. You're seeing a young, communal, interactive, game-based audience. But that's not the vision that Mark Zuckerberg is betting on. He's betting on what you see with the data on the left here, Oculus Quest, a device that takes you into this fully immersive, three-dimensional world. It's an interesting bet. We're seeing a lot of activity on a lot of different platforms here. I think these goggles, it's taken a long time for that business to come together. I think the same is going to be said for the metaverse, but I am telling you, every big tech company is developing something in this space. It may not have the heat right now. It is going to get bigger, but I do think ultimately this is a glacially slow business. To put it all in perspective, I will end on one last data point. We looked at a recent survey. Half of the people out there have never even heard of the metaverse. So let's slow our roll here. Let's say we come back next year and we'll talk about how much progress the metaverse has done. So that is all. We want to take your questions. If you want the deck that you just saw, whether you're watching here in the audience, thanks for coming, or you're streaming, take a, a look at that QR code and that deck will be yours. But why don't we take it over to some questions? Yeah, we got some questions. Uh, if everyone, you go on the South by Southwest Go app, you can actually vote on the questions that we'll answer. So that's cool. Um, I would also say, before we get cut out, if people wanted to follow you for your wisdom, Andy, how can they find you on social media? Twitter, A. Wallenstein, and you, sir, have a more distinctive name on Twitter. It's a bad name nowadays. I rule TV. It's an old name. Um, <laughs> But yes, that is it. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, we're actually doing a webinar on Tuesday looking at just the current status of, of the industries that they've reported. So if you want to come by on Variety's website then, on LinkedIn, come by. But now we'll do some questions. The first one we have, what is the future of news now that quasi-news entertainment podcasts like the Joe Rogan Experience have absolutely eclipsed standard news networks and viewer numbers? I don't know if that eclipsing is quite, uh, I mean, certainly Joe Rogan's got a, a, a big following. I don't know if that is necessarily something I would call eclipsing. I think, I think news, and I want to get your opinion as well, is at a critical crossroads right now. I'm interested in a lot of the new businesses that are coming together that I think are going to have to sort of change the shape and tone of news. But I also think the coverage right now uh, of the Ukraine from some of the biggest news networks and other entities out there are going to be a real sort of palate cleanser in terms of the excesses of the political polarization we saw from news networks. I think that'll change some things. Well, yeah, I, I think that news, um, the, the rise of podcasts for news really shows what I was saying. News is becoming entertainment, right? Like, it's not something that people are just churning in to see the facts most of the time these days. It's more, I want to hear, it's like echo chamber almost. But what is interesting, there are trends in even free streaming news. Every major cable network, or sorry, national news network, so ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS, have all launched 
national news streaming channels. And there's about 200 local news channels that are now available on streaming fast services too. So we're actually seeing an embrace of digital trying to reach everyone by traditional news. It may not be the same audience figures, but they are trying to sort of at least stay relevant and, and take the plunge, which is a, a smart move. But it just shows, I think, entertainment is just news these days. Um, another question, oh, we could take this anyway. What is the biggest pain point for consumers? It's got a few votes. So I guess in all of entertainment. I, I, I have one very clear answer. Content discovery. There's just so much fragmentation out there, so much out there. Podcast space to me is exhibit A in this regard. It's hard to find what you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that is true on the streaming services as well. They talk a lot about their algorithms and how I think there's still a long ways to go. Well, that's true because the algorithms are only, they're within each wall. So Netflix could know what you want to watch. But then if you go and use a different streaming service, that doesn't know what you watched on Netflix. It doesn't know what content you want to see. It's actually, that's where the, those little chips in the TVs come in very handy. You know, the ones that, if you're not aware, if you buy a new TV and it says something like, hey, would you love to get recommendations? If you want to be spied on, say yes. But Because uh, that's what it's doing. It's, it, it's not spying, but you know, they're, they're sending that information back and they're trying to create like a, a, a universal source. Um, do we think we'll ever see people getting their news, TV, sports, and even full movies streamed via social platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn in the future? There's been a lot of experimentation with that over the years. Uh, Facebook has, you know, in recent years done a lot of investing in premium entertainment, but it looks like they have stepped back from that. Uh, I think, as we talked about, I think the creator economy is really where the entertainment focus is for social networks. Yeah, it's actually surprising to me that we haven't seen streaming channels, for instance, built around some of these creators, because this is how younger people are consuming content. But let's see what else we have here. We have, where is education content going? It's got the most votes. So there is a tendency to treat education content as free and open sourced or non-franchisable, but billions is spent on consuming it. I will be honest, I don't think either of us are experts on education content. I know there is some modest investment over the years that I've seen entertainment companies do there. I look at things like Masterclass, and there's been a number of those kind of companies that have shown some really impressive growth over mm. recent years. Uh, who's to say we're not going to see an education brand like a Masterclass really start to blow out that market in a way that conventional TV never really had a place for, but streaming could make work? I'm, I'm kind of optimistic. I mean, if, if you want to go you know, like very broad, you could argue documentaries are like high quality sure. nature documentaries, that sort of thing. And some streaming services have put more money into it. Netflix is doing that. Um, Discovery Plus is doing that. So depending on how you view it, but yeah, like open source it's money on the table, if there's another pandemic. <laughs> Why is it unrealistic for Netflix to reach half a, million, half a billion to a billion subscribers? Well, you said that, so I'm not touching that. <laughs> well, I mean, over time, sure. But like right now, for instance, I think if you consider over the world, two things you've got to consider. Subscribers are, are, are they not the same as households, right? Not every, if, if you live in a household with four people, you only need one Netflix subscription. So you instantly have to sort of reduce the total number of potential subscribers versus the total number of viewers. Also remember, like, a lot of the world lacks broadband, high-speed broadband still. So if you're looking to expand globally, you've got to wait for those areas to catch up. So over the long term, yes, they could get to there. But like in the short term, which I think was the expectation within maybe like 2025, no. And that's why the stock is kind of hitting down there. Um, can we talk about LinkedIn and content? It's like the stepchild platform, and there's so much potential there. They've done some, I mean, not entertainment content, but... Uh, something I would call maybe educational or professional trade content. They've got stuff there. Do I see them suddenly putting together a, a sitcom? No, I think that's off brand. Our content there is very educational and oh, informative. Yeah. It's great. Um, <laughs> it is, it's me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Will Instagram begin prioritizing user posts if users follow their new marketing strategy and tag products in posts? Will this become the norm? That I'm going to say I'm stumped on. I have not really <laughs> followed what Instagram has changed with regard to user posts. I will note, and you may have noticed if you had an eagle eye, Instagram is no slouch. And I believe in the last quarter, Instagram's growth actually did manage to slightly exceed TikTok. So you never want to underestimate Instagram. I did hear, I spoke to a social media um, influencer the other day, and she said 
her and her friends have all said Instagram is dead and TikTok is the way to make content. But I don't. Well, then it's settled. <laughs> don't go against Asha Kosh here. Because ah, your friend. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you, why do you think TikTok will own social commerce and not perhaps a social commerce or social shopping startup? It's a great question. Because uh, I've spent the past few months looking at evidence of social commerce's growth across TikTok, Twitter. I haven't seen necessarily everybody. I just think that it's almost not about social commerce in and of itself. I just think that the tailwinds pushing TikTok right now is going to be something that will take that younger audience into social commerce in a way that other older skewing platforms won't be able to do. It doesn't, it's not a winner take all. I mean, all of them, I think, will see big growth from social commerce. I just think TikTok is going to take it to the next level. How long before news pundits like Carlson, Maddow, and Hannity are poached by streaming services? Streamers can certainly offer better paychecks. Well, let's not forget that these businesses are in the streaming business to some degree. You know, CNN is now porting their uh, talent over to CNN Plus, which launches at the end of the month. So, you know, Netflix has never had an appetite for news, and I think if they did, the, the poaching would have happened years ago. So I think in the short term, it's really, the talent is safe where they are. I think what could get interesting is what happens if a CNN Plus fails, which frankly I think is possible. I reckon 400,000 subs tops. I mean, I don't think it's going to do much, and then you can argue Warner Media is best taking, you know, HBO Max, Discovery, CNN, and doing one super brand. Mm. Um, but if the talent doesn't feel that they're getting served in streaming, maybe that does entice a Netflix to start poaching and taking big talent away. I would worry, though, that some of these people have a very specific halo around them. So if you were a broad-focused content streamer and you took someone like Hannity, you might actually scare some of your people off because customers would not be happy supporting that. Yeah. Um, topic, perhaps the last topic we get to, very close to your heart, near and dear. Any emerging media that you're paying attention to after the boom of SNS-friendly media such as BuzzFeed? What can we learn from their late challenges? Uh, the late challenges to learn from is don't get into that business because... Unless you're VIP. Yes, then you're doing great. I mean, companies like BuzzFeed and Vice and this sort of uh, what I would call digital native publishers, they are basically fighting for the crumbs left over in digital advertising that the big uh, Facebook and, and, and Alphabet are just scooping up that marketplace. And they have to diversify like crazy to get other revenue streams going. Some of them flirted with the SPAC route. I think uh, BuzzFeed actually went through with it, and it's been a rough ride. I wish I could say something encouraging about those businesses, but uh, it, it's very tough. Yeah, and that's it. All right, well, thank you all. We really appreciate your questions. Yeah, thanks for sticking around. Check out Variety Intelligence Platform and enjoy South by Southwest. Take care.